Leonidas. He, he was one of the first MEPs that I've met in the, in the European Parliament, exactly on the case of uh, the laws on uh, information on homosexuality in Lithuania. We were negotiators on behalf of our political groups there. And it was not only um, uh, shocking, uh, as I said, to see in the first day of the European Parliament that an European member state could have a law that was actually forbidding speech. If our conference was not on counterterrorism but on homosexuality, it may have been forbidden if any of you would be uh, minors. We could be fined, we could, be, we could go to court, etc., which was really absurd, only information on homosexuality. It was not only in the first day of the parliament, but also in the 14th of July, which is an important day for someone who studies the 18th century like me, because it is the day of the beginning of the French Revolution, and it's a day that stands as a metaphor for all the, 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 uh, all the great achievements against uh, arbitrariness on the part of the powers, the fall of the Bastille, uh, and for the uh, search of, uh, as, as the, the American Constitution says, the search for happiness that every, everyone has the right to. Uh, so that law against homosexuality, against information on homosexuality, was on both counts, uh, something that we were not expecting to see. Uh, but at the same time, this was sad in the beginning, but it was also the beginning of a, of a uplifting discovery in the European Parliament, which is that uh, people from different political groups uh, have formed what I can now say after a year there, an informal alliance. It starts uh, uh, from Leonidas' group and also Christa's group, although she's not in the European Parliament, but her party is there, in the ALDE, which is a liberal group in the European Parliament. Then the Greens, they are the ones that are not at this table, but they are also our friends and colleagues in this, in this fight. The Socialists and the European United Left, where I am. We have been in the, in, the, in the field of civil liberties, we have almost, a, I hope that by saying it, we, we will not endanger it, but almost a working coalition. We need the votes of everybody. If one of these elements lack, we lose. So on my part, I've been trying to ensure that in as many times as possible, the, the votes of the European United Left are in this coalition. So working with Leonidas, also with Sophie Nittfeld from, from Christa's party, and of course Anna, and uh, uh, colleagues from the Greens who are also very valuable in this, in, this, uh, in this area. So this was the nice surprise to see that the European Parliament, uh, um, which is still sometimes an uncomprehended institution, uh, and some of it is good because it's a, it's a different parliament from what we have at the national level. And I think that we develop, not losing our differences, we develop very good working relations uh, in, in, uh, in cross-party. Well, um, Anna has already referred for, uh, to, to the SWIFT affair. SWIFT it's, it's, is the Society for Worldwide Interbank Financial Transfers. And if you go to your online bank account, you will, uh, and you try to make a, a bank transfer, if it's a national bank transfer, you'll use one system, but maybe you'll see there that there's a room, a, a, an empty field for the SWIFT code. So if you send money to Spain, even here, you're sending it via a SWIFT transfer. So this company has been formed in the 70s. It's actually a consortium of banks, headquarters in Belgium, but they had uh, mirror servers in the United States, subject to American law. After the 9-11 attacks, the, the, and with all the new legislation, counter-terrorist legislation, Homeland Security legislation acts uh, 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 in the United States, the Treasury, who had already, since they were the, 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 they, they had jurisdiction over banks, the American Treasury started asking uh, uh, data from the SWIFT company uh, uh, servers headquartered in the United States and not telling uh, the, their European allies about this. So this was from the beginning, and we'll talk about these words for, uh, I, will, I will talk about, I will repeat this word several times in my intervention, it is a matter of trust. So 
the, 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 the Americans wanted the Europeans to trust them in the war on terror, but at the same time, they were not willing to trust us with the information that they were pillaging our data, that they were already consulting them. So from 2001 to 2006, this happened in full secrecy. In 2006, the American media discovered about it. So it was a big scandal in Europe. And uh, 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 there was an agreement between Europe and the United States that one person will be sent to the United States to see what was happening there. So this was actually after, a few days after uh, uh, we were wor working on the hom homosexual information law in Lithuania, uh, uh, MEPs from the committee where uh, both me and Anna are the Civil Liberties Committee, I'm a coordinator in this, in this, uh, uh, in this committee, so I, I had to go to a meeting where we had a report by a French judge called Bruguière. This was the person that had been sent to the United States to see how were the Americans dealing with our data. Uh, well, and so it was the beginning of a, a, an entry into a world of secrecy, sometimes of ridiculous secrecy and sometimes of complete opaqueness. Sometimes I have the feeling that what is shown to us is what is meaningless, although secret, uh, but uh, sometimes, well, of course, what we don't see is much worse. So, for six years, the Americans could be rummaging, pillaging our data, and we're not knowing anything. Like, also, uh, uh, Anna has met also this kind of, of, of activities in torture, in extraordinary renditions. But we are called into a room, a secret room. We have to sign papers because we are going to be shown the report of Judge Bruguière. And I cannot tell you about the report because it's secret. I've signed the term. I cannot say anything about it. But, well, I can say two things about what has been said about the report. One is that, of course, I am obliged to secrecy, but people from the European Commission and from the, and from the American administration has, have used it a lot. So, as the report from Judge Bruguier has shown, this is very important. Having your bank account is very important to catch terrorists. Uh, and so, well, it seems it's secret for me, but not secret for them. They use it a lot, but actually the report does not prove that. You have no empirical links. As, as much this I have to say, because I have to fight this information on the other side. And of course, I can say that uh, Judge Bruguer is exactly the kind of judge in France, he was handpicked, that stands the more to gain from information from the Americans because we give what we were doing was actually outsourcing, uh, 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 like in torture, outsourcing uh, uh, intelligence work to the Americans. They have our bank accounts and sometimes when they find interesting things they give back to uh, uh, our police forces or to anti-terrorist judges like Judge Bruguer in France. They get the data, they make a very easy arrest of a terrorist in France, and well, things flow, they work, they, Judge Bruguer gets in the media, a good arrest, etc. Maybe it's for the good, but let's point out that this is not reciprocity. They were telling us this is reciprocity, well, it's not. Reciprocity would be if they have access to European bank accounts, we have access to American bank accounts in exactly the same level. Why not? We are both. Uh, uh, as people say, law-abiding uh, global players, why not? Reciprocity, it's not giving, it's about 90 million uh, financial messages each month. So it's billions, billions in the, in the, in the American uh, numeric system, but hundreds or thousands, thousands of millions of pieces of financial data from our bank accounts flowing every year to the United States, and of course we've got some tips flowing in the other direction to our police. That's also one reason why ministers of, the, of home affairs from several member states were very keen on having this. Of course, well, it's precious for police, and I do understand. I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, uh, either an investigator or a police officer, but I'm an historian. It, it's it's uh, actually very similar, uh, although I'm investigating things about the 18th century. When I'm in the Torre do Tombo, which are our national archives, just on the other side of, of this uh, lawn, 
well, I want everything that I can have. If I can have things about uh, financial life of the people that I study in the 18th century, I want it. If I, if, if I can have a piece of, informa of, of information on their sexual life, I want it. If I have something about their you know, uh, uh, kids out of marriage, I want that also. Well, of course, I want everything. On the side of the historian, that makes sense. Maybe on the side of the police officer, it also makes sense to have everything that they can get. On the side of the, of the intelligence community, well, everything is valuable for them. And I do understand that. When we go to Washington on the Swift affair or on the PNR affair, which, which is a, a case that's been uh, um, uh, is on the hands also of Sophie Nitveld, so the, the colleague of uh, the, the, the comrade of Chris uh, on, on her party. I don't know if you say comrades in the 66, but <laughs> the colleague, well, also member of the party. And uh, today I, 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 I will uh, meet again with Sophie Nitveld on the PNR case. What police officers and people from the intelligence community tell us that I can tell you because we also have to sign confidentiality forms about the meetings that we have with them or when we uh, look at, the, at their facilities, they say, well, there has been one case where a terrorist attack was 15 years in the making. So it makes sense to keep your data for 15 years. There was a case of a terrorist attack coming from Southern Europe. So we ask, uh, uh, the data, the bank data for, for Portugal and Spain and Italy for six months. So millions and millions of pieces of, of financial data. Well, for them it makes sense. But we have to see things also from the other perspective, from the citizen's perspective. We are not law, law enforcement uh, officers. We are representatives. And many of you wouldn't give even your PIN code to your best friend. And you don't know that you are giving all your financial uh, transfer, or even worse than that, because PNR, the Sophie Nitveld case, it's maybe even worse than SWIFT. Well, SWIFT, it's bank data, it's more or less, it's the kind of, of stable data that banks have a lot of trouble to keep in pretty much a good uh, shape for their own reasons of rel reliability. But PNR data, it's passengers, names, records. It's the kind of information that you give to uh, um, travels agencies, uh, uh, airline companies, etc. when you travel. So what do you give? You give your credit card number, uh, the hotel that you book, the car that you rent, your, uh, uh, your, your trajectory, and the person that you're staying with, for instance. So the person that you're sleeping with in the hotel, in the country that you're going to, and all this well, you say, if I have nothing to hide, like Risa was saying, I'm okay. But don't forget that this may be subject to tampering, because think about how many people uh, look into this data and change it. The guy in the, in the, in the travel agency encounter, someone in the airport, someone in the hotel, etc. Well, if you have a rival, an enemy, some, someone who's not well-intentioned, they can tamper with your data, and you will get uh, 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 extra screening in the, in the, in the border. Also, the reasons for screening, this I, I've had in non-confidential uh, uh, disclosure from Australians, the reasons for you having extra screening in, 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 in the Australian border, and the Australians are much better than the Americans. If you have one name in your ticket and another name in your credit card, if you have sudden changes of plans, of travel plans, and if you have been in, uh, uh, um, well, suspicious countries. And I was listening to this and I was thinking, wow, I could very well be a, a suspect because as many of us here in Portugal, I have a long name with five names. People book my, 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 my uh, tickets as Rui Tavares, but actually my last name is not Tavares. I have another name in my credit card. And well, I change a lot of travel plans as all MEPs do, and I had been in Syria, and then I had been in, the, in Algeria in the Polisario-dominated area, working for the parliament. But, well, I could very well get to the United States and be, I don't know, screened. And this happens. I was with a, with a, with a guy from, from our, an advisor from our political group, and we went to uh, the Forum de São Paulo. It was in Mexico City. It's a, a meeting of 
left-wing parties from uh, Latin America, and we were there as observers. And this guy, who had worked on, on Colombia, and who is married to a Colombian, it's a, he's a Belgian citizen, and he's certainly on, on the files of the, of the infamous Colombian uh, intelligence service. I don't remember their name now, but they, they are quite, they are quite suspicious characters. Uh, I don't know how he got in the in the Americans' files. And his airplane, it was an Air France airplane. He was supposed to cross American airspace, and he had to be, uh, um, how do you say? It had to be uh, diverted so as to not uh, uh, cross Florida airspace. It had to go uh, through another way. And then one of the, he didn't know that it was because of him, but one of, the, one of the hostesses of the airplane said, you know, we are losing one hour because of you. Then he got on the planes, he got on, 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 the, on the press, his case was known, and when he came back home, he knew that his kids on school had been taunted by other kids, saying, your father is a terrorist. Oh, maybe he is, maybe he's not, I don't know. He was in our group, our is a pretty much left-wing group, and people were saying, what did he do? Why is he there? He was in my office saying, well, I tried to remember if I did something that maybe is suspicious. So it's, it's part of this being an ungrateful work, the kind of work that we do at the civil liberties level, is that for 90% of the people, nothing ever happens. So this will happen to one guy, one Belgian guy. To, this will happen to Omar Hadr. This will happen to people like that. And you'll think, maybe you were suspicious. And 99% 90 of us will go on living our lives. Of course, if it happens to you, to one of these persons, your life is completely disrupted and destroyed. And maybe you were an innocent. But 99% 90, 90 of the people can go on thinking it's not like it's not going to happen to them. Well, uh, we rejected SWIFT the first time. In the second time, uh, the parliament finally approved. And it was heartbreaking to see on several sides of, of the parliament, several political groups, people voting either for or against it, knowing if they were going to trust the European Commission, knowing if they were going to, uh, or if they were going to reject and be pointed as people were allowing for terrorists to, 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 uh, to make attacks. And by the way, of course, terrorist attacks happen. When we were on, the, on Washington for the Swift case, I decided to come via New York to visit a friend there. And this was, end of April, the, the 1st of May, uh, I decided to go to the Apple store in, 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 in Manhattan, and I was actually, you know, a, a few hundred meters from the Times Square at the day of the Times Square attack. Of course, SWIFT data will do nothing to prevent the, the Times Square attack, but it's true, well, uh, nobody wants to die in a terrorist attack, and they do happen. But on the other hand, um, also we have to see that uh, terrorist attacks are changing us in many more ways than what we think. Before leaving Washington, there was a day that every MEP had, had a, a, um, a meeting or a dinner, and I went alone to, I had nothing to do, I went alone to see uh, something very American, uh, uh, an improv act in a, in a, in a comedy club. And there was this guy who made improvisation comedy and he asked people, what do you do? So this was Washington and he said, he asked to four or five people, what do you do? And the first guy says, well, I'm a contractor for the army. And then he asked to another guy, what do you do? And uh, well, I work in uh, um, information systems. And what do you do? Well, I work in homeland security. So the first guy, what do you do? And he worked in something else like this. Well, four. Successive people, they all worked in the intelligence community, in the, uh, in the homeland security community, etc. The, 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 the fifth guy that he asked was unemployed. So this was, of course, after the, the financial crisis. So the, the comedian just went over to the guy that was unemployed and said, well, let's all pay a beer to this guy. So there was four people in the intelligence community when one uh, unemployed. As the Washington Post newspaper revealed uh, last month, it's uh, some, you, you look for, you Google for top secret America. There are now almost one million people working on 
intelligence services in the United States. 850,000 of them have access to confidential documents. So how are these people, 850,000, how are they going to make sense, even start to make sense of uh, confidential documents? It's too many people. And maybe too many ridiculous uh, secret documents. Maybe it will be better to just have lots of them, lots of those documents released and have everybody, including citizens, looking at these documents and making sense of them. Well, these people will have to justify their jobs. And they will have to justify their jobs by gathering more information. So, okay, bank data. Now they've had it, it's already theirs. Afterwards, well, tra travel info. That's what we are dealing now with. We're trying to prevent for them to, to get access to this, and they want to have it for everything. Not only anti-terrorism, also drug trafficking, it's also important, and, well, child trafficking, how not have it, it's also important, but serious crime, what is serious crime, it's a little bit more uh, ambiguous, etc. Well, what happens when systems uh, have this scale is that they start to be a state within the state. And the bigger state that we're in, it's, uh, we, we call it in, in, in Portuguese, Estado de Direito, a state abiding by the rule of law. And I find it very worrisome that I keep hearing again and again, this is the part that you'll find also in the, in the, in the chronicle I told you about in the op-ed. Um, I hear ministers, judges, uh, 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 commissioners of the, of the European Union telling us that we have to find the right spot between fundamental rights and security. We have to find a balance. Uh, no, we, we don't have to find a balance. It's not like that. Fundamental rights and security are two different things, both important, but they behave in different ways. So you cannot say, I'm going to give 10% less fundamental rights, or maybe half, what do you think? 50% fundamental rights and 50% security? Does it work like this? What will be the, the right balance? No, a state of law, um Estado de Direito, has first, has its first obligation to respect fundamental rights. And then they can do a lot in order to achieve security. Although we will, not, we will never have absolute security. This does not exist. And if we start undoing our fundamental rights in order to achieve uh, total security, we will end up like Latin America in the 70s, with no freedom and no security. Uh, so it's, in, in the end, it's a question of uh, how, how would we like to be known in the future? So uh, we ha we've had this, this, uh, this, uh, um, this kind of dilemma in the past. For instance, if you go there to the Tour du Tombe, to the National Archives, and ask for the Inquisition records, you'll see that lots of people uh, uh, underwent terrible situations because of sometimes silly things. You'll find people, women arrested because they were uh, 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 cleaning their house uh, um, in, the, in the opposite direction. What is this? It is because, well, of course, Christians used to broom their, 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 their houses to the door because they had, you know, regular house with a, uh, with a, a door to the, to the street and they were, you know, just brooming their houses to the street. But Jewish families didn't do this because they usually have the, the Ten Commandments by the door. And uh, uh, it's called the, 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 the mezuzah. It's, well, an amulet that uh, Jewish families use by the door. So even one generation, two generations after they've been baptized, Girls had been taught by their mothers to broom the house in the other direction and gather the dust and send it away. You have people, maybe, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of people. We have uh, uh, 40,000 people from 200 year, years in this country arrested by things like this, not eating pork. And why? Well, because the Inquisition had, uh, uh, during this time, they had a network of people they called the Os Familiares da Santa Inquisição also thousands of people. And they had to justify the money that they were getting from the Inquisition. So they were finding Jews everywhere, okay? So when institutions become a state within the state, 
they will end up not upholding f fundamental rights, but violating them. That's what we are creating. So how would we like to be known? Would we like to be known as the 50s, as the era, as the era of McCarthyism, paranoia, anti-communism, you know, forcing people to, to, to suicide, to, to, to terrible lives because they were suspect of being communists? Or would we like to be known as the 60s, the conquest of the moon and civil rights? It's, it's actually uh, our choice, it's your choice. I think that the beginning of the, of the 20th century, as uh, Anna has very well illustrated, talking about uh, torture and extraordinary renditions, is already a very, it's, it, it's already been, uh, how do you say, um, marked by uh, paranoia. So, People will ask us, when you were in charge, why did you let these things happen? But I hope that the, 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 this next decade, students from this house and universities like this will think that the next 10 years, we are going to be known for other things. Advancement of science. About, I, was, I, I was receiving someone from the, uh, the lobby of uh, uh, body scanners telling us how important it was to have body scanners in, in the airport. And I was almost convinced. Uh, well, it's important, it's not, I don't like to go through a manual screening, so, but the, those scanners cost 150,000 euros or 200,000 euros each. Are we going to put this in all the airports in Europe? At the same time, we had the earthquake in, in Haiti and we had difficulty in, you know, finding people, uh, uh, you know, uh, buried in, in, in rubble. What do we prefer to do? spend all that money in body scanners or spend all that money in other kinds of engineering solutions to help people when an earthquake strikes. So this is the kind of choice that uh, we are going to do for the next years and I hope that we are able to make the, the right choice on this. Thank you.